what we're setting out to do is completely change what engineering, manufacturing, and production looks like. Everything is about extracting as much performance as, as you can. Inference-based simulation is making simulation more consumable and democratized across the enterprise. I can be a designer, and I can do that via an agent, so I'm excited about that. Welcome to Nebius Conversations at Slush. I'm here with Giacomo Corbo from PhysicsX, co-founder and CEO. Welcome, Giacomo. It's great to have Delighted you. Delighted to be here, Linnea. You've had a very intense but exciting period with announcements about your latest funding raise led by NVIDIA and a partnership with Deutsche Telekom. I was watching also the Atomico State of European Tech Report, and you said that PhysicsX is out to completely reinvent the most important industries in the world today. Can you tell us a little bit about how you intend to do that? So we're building a new engineering simulation software stack, and the, what we're setting out to do is completely change what engineering, manufacturing, and production looks like and across a, a number of advanced industries. So think of things like automotive and aerospace, think also of semiconductor equipment manufacturing, think of um, you know, mining and materials as, as, as well. So you know, everywhere that we are designing really complex things, engineering things, trying to manufacture them, complex production processes, a lot of that runs through simulation. And the way that that simulation is done today um, involves numerical simulation. It runs through a whole lot of expertise. It, it is incredibly manual. It's very hard to automate. It involves many handoffs, but between people with different technical specialisms. So we're out to change a lot of that. And it starts from changing what the compute around simulation looks like and moving beyond numerical simulation to inference, to AI models that are doing this on inference. Okay, yeah, interesting. Of course, inference is something Nebius understands a lot about, so I'm really excited to get into that a little bit more. Sure. So obviously you have your roots in Formula One engineering and an illustrious career at that. Um, but what made you realize that AI could fundamentally change how engineers work? I you know, started my career in, in, in Formula One, uh, was a chief race strategist for the Renault F1 team, and it's where I met my co-founder at PhysicsX, Robin Tuluy. I, I think it's having an appreciation for what engineering looks like, uh, having an appreciation for what manufacturing looks like, that ha ultimately got you know, Robin and I to you know, start seeing perhaps an opportunity to change all of that in virtue of being able to take advantage of some advances that were taking place around AI, um, different AI architectures that were very good at learning physics. Um, and, and the idea of moving to inference, right, of moving off numerical simulation, I mean, it's, it's, it's not a new idea. It's been around for, for quite some time. The issue is that um, we, we just couldn't get it to work. So, you know, when, when we set up PhysicsX, um, and uh, Robin and I uh, have spent our careers in, in, in different places, like as a co-founder of Quantum Black and its chief scientist, um, you know, Robin, um, you know, post his time at Renault, became the chief scientist at Mercedes GP, was then, you know, in charge of virtual simulation as a vehicle technology director for Bentley overall, but involved in virtual simulation across a lot of the VW group. And we, we started seeing like, look, um, we're gonna set up this vehicle, you know, PhysicsX to, you know, as a vehicle for experimentation. Like we think that there's something here that is incredibly interesting and can meet the requirements of engineering. But the question is like, there's no grand unified theory here. And so everything is empirical. So we started trying things. In the first place in aerospace, um, you know, starting on, you know, things of, on the lower end of complexity. So think of, uh, Think of parts, uh, th things that don't have moving parts. So um, intercoolers and heat exchangers, and then started going into things that are more complex. We started working with the Formula One team, you know, around you know, FE, finite element analysis problems, so multi-material FEA problems. And then after that, we started going into you know, turbo machinery, still on the lower end of complexity, before going into things that were more complex. And over the course of the last few years, we've added you know, different physics that we can accommodate and also um, you know, um, greater complexity around what those physics look like and the kinds of geometries that we can accommodate that have gotten us to you know, where we are now, which is being able to touch a lot of the most complex applications across a number of different industrial verticals. Yeah. 
And those are really like industries to cut your teeth on, if you will, aerospace and Formula One, because the efficiencies that you can gain from just the smallest amount of optimizations shows up so immediately, right? Yeah, For, Formula One teams, um, you know, if I, I think engineering companies on the whole exhibit this, which is this strong ethic and commitment to continuous improvement. And the Formula One teams, I think, feel that, you know, in, incredibly strongly because, you know, it's a zero sum game, right? It's all about competition. And so if you think that there's a way into some advantage, then you absolutely go after it. Everything is about extracting as much performance as, as you can and trying to drive as much engineering productivity, trying to compress development timelines. Um, so, you know, it fits with the kind of improvements that we're trying to provide to industry. So similar to what has to happen in AI infrastructure, right? Because it's about finding the optimization opportunities across the entire stack. I'm curious, what does the infrastructure need to look like to support these specialized physics models as opposed to, say, a LLM and general transformer models? You know, when we talk about like what we're providing as technology to customers here and trying to help them get, you know, move beyond numerical simulation, which is really about taking numerical simulation out of the workflow, or trying to bring higher fidelity simulation to more of the product development life cycle, so to more of the engineering life cycle, like it's important to say that um, numerical simulation still plays with the inference-based models and inference-based simulation that we're, we're providing. And so we, you know, if you think about workloads overall, um, there's numerical simulation and more numerical simulation. And a lot of those solvers themselves are moving to GPUs, right? And, and it's important to move them to GPUs because we're seeing, you know, pretty substantial accelerations. So it's, you know, on the order of, you know, five to 10 to even 50X over what the CPU codes look like. And, for us, that's, that's incredibly important because you know, we're not working on the solver side for the models that we're you know, developing. There, there are two things that we're, we're doing. Like outside of customer deployments, we are developing larger and larger pre-trained models. So we're doing the data, data generation, we're training these models, and then we're deploying them at customers where they are fine tuning them, right? On, on top of the software stack that we're providing for them. But they're also, you know, if you think about large industrials, large industrials are in a position where they certainly have the data, they have the simulation tool chains, the engineering tool chains on which to train their own private foundation models. And so there we're providing a lot of the software stack, the developer tooling for them to be able to, to do this um, at, at, at some scale. And then after that to be able to fine tune them for individual applications. So, you know, it's the complement of numerical simulation workloads, as well as these inference-based simulation, but all of it increasingly moving to, to GPUs. Certainly the inference side certainly is. Um, and I, I'd say one more thing, which is the fact that we are making you know, simulations you know, a whole lot faster. And when I say a whole lot faster you know, in moving them to inference, I mean 10,000 to close to a million times faster. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. so it's, it's a whole lot faster and process. it's so much faster that um, you're in a world where the needs for simulation go up. Like we can not only use much more of it in the context of exploring large spaces for designing things and engineering things, but we can also go downstream of that to places where right now simulation can't go and that's in manufacturing and operations. And so we're driving within the enterprise a need for you know, we're unlocking new applications where there wasn't a need for as much high fidelity simulation, but we can do it now and we can package it up in ways that are highly consumable, which is, you know, via, via inference. And that in turn is driving a complement where there is a need for more numerical simulation as well. So these, th this really is turning a flywheel and simulations are moving more and more of their processes to, you know, virtual and silico based engineering and manufacturing processes. Something else that everyone is talking about at the moment is agentic AI. So how do you see agentic AI fitting into all of this? It's a great question. So, you know, the things that we're training are really, you know, trained on numerical simulation, on physics, on chemistry. So they're not language models, um, but, you know, 
one of the things that people are incredibly excited about is being able to develop agents that will be specialized on, on different domains. And one of the things that's taking place right now as we're speaking is the Ignite conference uh, in, in San Francisco with, uh, with Microsoft. And um, you know, yesterday we, we unveiled some of the things that we're doing with Microsoft and their discovery platform. And a lot of that is predicated on being able to orchestrate these models with agents. So to be able to have agents that are developing new workflows, new engineering workflows. And so this is an agent that is interfacing with one of our fast inference models and coming up with you know, a way to do work, right? Navigating some engineering process. And it need not be engineering, but it's, uh, and it's, it's, it's allowing these things to become you know, specialist in different domains, adapted to different you know, parts of the of, of, of the, the, the world of work that our, our, our users and our you know, customers, engineers are, are navigating. So you know, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about if inference-based simulation is making simulation more consumable and democratized across the enterprise, uh, packaging it up in ways that it can be you know, deployed everywhere. Um, you know, agents are also the thing that is going to make it more enterprise consumable to just a bro much broader base of, of, of users, right? I can be a designer, I'm not a simulation engineer, I'm not a deep expert in aerodynamics or thermal simulations and whatnot, yeah. but I can have, I can interrogate how a given design or a choice of materials is, you know, going to, you know, uh, what, what its implications for performance would be. And I can do that via an agent that will tee up all the simulations that will even get into some optimization and modifications of the design to account for the performance requirements that I have. Um, so I'm excited about that. I feel like there is so much that we could unpack here, but unfortunately we're running a little bit out of time. So I will thank you so much, Giacomo, for coming on the show with us It's today. been a real pleasure. Thank, thank you. you.